And it is a glorious Wednesday, and the New York Mets have lost yet again in the Subway Series. And with the Braves' win over the Pirates last night, we are now within two games of the division lead, baby. Here we come. What's up, Mets? What's up, Mets fans? Can you hear the footsteps? Can you hear the end nearing? Can you see the light at the end of the tunnel? And have you yet realized that it's a train coming for your lives? I mean, it's happening. The Mets are crumbling. I knew it. I called this a month ago. I said the Mets have a highly defined and well-tuned and well-oiled machine of blowing it. They blow it. It is what they do. It's in their nature. It's written in their DNA. They can't help themselves, and it's happening. And now they're playing the Yankees. The Yankees are great. The Mets have won a lot, so, you know, whatever. But the Braves are too. The Braves are great. The Braves are going to take it. I I predict that two weeks from now, we're going to be in the lead. You know, the Mets are going to come back around, because I know that they have a really tough schedule right now, but both the Braves and the Mets' schedules ease up a bit here in the next few weeks. I know going into the later half of, like, August and September, you know, it really, it's, it's getting easier for both. But really, in two weeks, we're going to be in the lead. And once we take it, as soon as we take it, we're not looking back. It's one of those things that if you hold the lead for that long, if you're the Mets and you hold it for that long and then you lose it and it slips through the grasp of your hands like trying to hold water and it just slips right through, it just, you're not, it's not, it's, you know, it it is what it is. The writing is on the wall. I can feel it in my bones. I can feel it in my soul. It's just, it's coming and it's fantastic. It is fantastic. They are imploding. They're imploding with such force that light can't escape it. The black hole that we can all hear now. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but in the news, you know, the news is going crazy because scientists have now retrieved audio from a black hole. How they did it, I don't know. I don't even know if it's real, but they say that it is, and it sounds very eerie and ominous and creepy, and I think that's just the sound of the Met season imploding. It's very timely that this footage and this audio has come out now because I think we all know exactly what's happening. It's the Mets crumbling into the abyss, and it's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. It's uh, history making. So here we go. Let's go, Braves fans. So thank you for tuning in. As always, welcome to All Gas, All Georgia Sports. And we have a lot to cover, as always. And you know, I realized last episode, I was so jacked for fantasy football hype that I didn't start the show with any trivia. That's my thing. That's what I do. I always start the show with trivia, and I end you guys on a positive, go make someone's day kind of note. It's just, it's cyclical. It's what I do. And I didn't do it last time, so I apologize. So we are going to start this episode with some trivia, going to do some baseball trivia for you guys. And your trivia question is, who has the record for the best batting average in a season? Who has the record for the best batting average in a season? Now, this is post-1900. So there's your clue. It's not really a clue. You have 122 years to work with there. But post-1900, who has the record for the best batting average in a season? So think about that. See if you can think. If you know this, you're a real brave, uh, not Braves fan. And that was not a Freudian slip. Um... Uh, if you know this, you're a real baseball fan is what I meant to say. You are a hardcore fan, and I will respect the hell out of you if you get this. So truly, um, email me, talkingallgas at gmail.com. You can put it on our Twitter. You can comment on our TikTok. We've been blowing up on TikTok like, lately. It's fantastic. Big shout out to DJ Whisper, Robbie, for putting together these videos for us. They've been amazing. He's been clipping parts of our episodes putting them up on TikTok, and they've been getting absolutely blown up. So it's pretty cool. It's validating to see that people are enjoying what we're putting out there. So thank you guys for listening and for supporting. So if you do know the answer, you know, say it out loud to yourself or email me, and I'll tell you if it's right or wrong. Um, Well, that's silly because I'm going to tell you at the end of the episode. That sounded like a great idea as I was it was coming out of my mouth. Then as I realized I'm going to divulge the answer at the end, that that's that's really stupid. So. Whatever, email me anyway, say what's up. So uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of Braves recap. Got a you know couple of solid wins to go over with you guys. Um, game one versus the Pirates was on Monday night in Pittsburgh. And don't they have a beautiful stadium? I mean, God, they've got 
they have the best view in the majors. It's just, it's perfect. If you're sitting anywhere in the, as long as you're not facing in, if you get a chance to look out and to see that, you know, skyline, that Pittsburgh skyline, that's just gorgeous. So it's, even on TV, it's pretty. So I just like when they play in Pittsburgh because I like seeing that. It's just cool. So, you know, and of course it makes it that much better when the Braves are dominating. Um, but game one, it wasn't really a domination. Uh, it was a bit of a snooze, actually. We did win two to one, but um, yeah, not a whole lot of recap and highlights from that game. I mean, both pitchers pitched well. I will say this, Odorizzi pitched well. He, what are his exact stats? Let me pull that up for you guys. Because that's worth saying, because last time I pretty much said he's a glorified batting practice pitcher, pitcher. So, you know, the fact that he pitched well is worth reporting. So he goes f- uh, six innings, only four hits, and one earned run with seven Ks. So good job, Jake Odorizzi. You did good. Um, our only runs came from a Michael Harris two-run home run. Uh, Acuna goes two for four. That's notable just because Acuna doesn't feel that dangerous right now. He hasn't for a while, even though I know statistically the last month he's gotten a lot better. And, you know, he's putting together better at bats. He's had more, you know, on base opportunities where he can be really dangerous with his legs. He's his averages up. But, you know, I'm used to seeing so much of that Acuna power just every time he comes up. It's like he could rip one. And I just don't feel that with him right now. So uh, him going two for four, no, no RBIs, no run scored, nothing like that. But I don't know, two for four is a good night. So good job. Um, but Michael Harris, Actually, statistically here, only goes one for one, but he had two walks and two RBIs, and that one hit was a home run to uh, the opposite field. And I don't know if anyone's seen this. This is pretty cool, but it's going around on Twitter lately, and they have Acuna and Michael Harris side by side, and their batting stance is identical. It's pretty cool creepy actually when you see it it really is like and and it, I think it's because of the angle that you watch the games at like it's it's to the right side of the pitcher so it's always if you've noticed you know watching a right-handed pitcher versus a left-handed pitcher you know the angles of the ball always look like lefties always seem a lot nastier to me on TV but I think it's just because of the angle we're watching their balls come in so their sliders coming in look like they break so much more so I know there's a little bit of like camera angle tricks that are going on so I didn't catch this but once I saw this picture I was like holy shit they really are like their batting stances are like identical it's pretty cool um so anyways interesting stuff uh you know thank you Twitter but yeah game one we won it was great you know good job you know, that just kind of kept our momentum going in the right direction. And game two was a bit more of a bloodbath on our end. And I loved the way that we won game two. So game two, we win six to one. That was on Tuesday night. And we really put it on them in the fifth inning. So basically what happened is it was 0-1. And I'm going to get into Max Fried here in a sec too, because he was fantastic on Tuesday night. Really, really good. But the Braves hadn't scored anything up to the fourth inning. In the fifth, Darno starts starts us off with a solo home run. And then we ended up scoring five in the fifth. But after that solo shot, it was just small ball. It was small ball for four runs. It was um, sack flies, you know, uh, singles, singles, walks. It was just, it was that you know, just you. if you're the opposing team, you're just like, God, we just can't get out of it. And I love when we can score like that as opposed to a bunch of solo shots because a solo shot you can kind of ride off. The way that Max Fried did, because he only gave up one run and he went eight innings, he was fantastic, but the one run that he gave up was a solo shot in the second. And if you're getting runs like that, it's kind of like, okay, that was a fluke, that was a fluke hit, you know, I, I let one get away it's not like I'm crumbling and every every batter is getting longer and more, you know, psychologically frustrating. It um yeah, you know, it's we just played played a lot of small ball and just crushed them. It was a long fifth inning for the Pirates and they never recovered. We ended up scoring another run in the seventh inning, but after that fifth it was done. Um because by that point too, Max Fried he was just absolutely lights out. So get this. Well, I'm going to give you the hitting stats. I'll save Max for the last. Um, Acuna goes one for five. Dansby goes one for four. Let's see who's ooh Von Grissom goes three for four. First ever three hit night in Von Grissom's young career. First of many, based on the way that he's playing. And I mean, he was three for three up until his last at bat. So we were like, oh man, is he going to go four for four? But I mean, the dude's a run-scoring machine. I think he scored as many runs as games played, 14. 
I believe that's a correct uh, statistic. But yeah, Vaughn Grissom is just, just sign him, sign him, do it, whatever, you know, it's fine. I mean, we've seen all we need to see, although, I don't know, other rookies have done this before where they've come out hot and then they cool off a bit, but the dude's just like lighting it up right now. I mean, who would have thought that we would have a second baseman tearing it up who's not named Ozzy Albies? And speaking of, what's going to happen when Ozzy comes back? What do you guys think's going to happen? Do you throw one of them in the DH? I mean, Vaughn Grissom's fielding is fantastic. I think he's a natural shortstop. So curious to see what's going to happen with these Dansby Swanson negotiations, because I know that his representation has now gone to the Braves going, okay, you've extended Harris. You have all these rookies that are locked up, or you know, young guys that are locked up for the next 10 years. Um, what about me? What about Dansby? And Dansby's had a year that he can really go to them with some leverage. He might be up for a new contract anyways at the end of this year, but talk about timing. You know, he has really timed this right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yeah, you know, he's the shortstop. He's our guy. He feels like the heart and soul of this team in many ways. But Von Grissom coming up, you know, you go, man, is it going to be a lot cheaper to have Von Grissom next year instead of Dansby Swanson? I don't know. I, I'm a big Dansby fan, so I'm not saying I want this. But, yeah, what do you do when Ozzy comes back? Let me see if I have an exact date on Ozzy Albee's return. Uh, because last I checked, it was September was the worst-case scenario. So, Ozzy Albies, mm, that was eight days ago. None of this stuff is that up to date. Six days ago, uh, taking a big step towards return, yada, 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 yada. Let's see if Fox Sports has anything up to date. I'm not going to spend too much time looking while y'all are listening. But four days ago, it says, um, Albies, who has been on the uh, July 15th, broken down, yada, 16th, yeah, it didn't tell me anything. Last I heard, it was late August, early September, and September being the worst case scenario. But everything is pointing to late August, which is now. So in the next week or so, we could be seeing an Ozzy Albies return. And when that happens, yeah, what do you do with Grissom? I mean, put one of them in the DH. Maybe you start Ozzy in the DH. Maybe give him a bit of a break from running around in the field as he's getting back up to speed. I don't know. But you got to find a way to play Grissom. You ha you have to, you know, have to. So I don't know. It's a good problem to have. I'll say that much. So, anyways, Von Grissom's great and Max Freed. Did I already say his stats? I don't think I did. Max Freed goes eight innings, only gives up three hits, one earned run, one walk, and seven Ks. And he had a really low pitch count. He was pitching to a lot of contact. He was under seventy pitches in the seventh inning. I think after the seventh, he had just clipped 70, but at one point, I think with two outs, he was at like 67, 68. He was just pitching to contact. He was getting guys out quick. It was just bam, 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 and his location was on. That dude's a beast. I mean, there's so many guys that we have that I'm like, yeah, what's Max Free going to do? When's his contract up? I don't know. I don't have that information right in front of me. I'll get it for next episode, but something for you to chew on, something for you to think about. So... Yeah. Uh, another thing that I'm going to just note here is I'm not sure if it's just when I'm watching, but um, Robbie Grossman seems legit. And because every time I watch him, he's like getting home runs. He's having timely hits. He's playing really hard. So he's fun to watch. And I looked up his stats and he's only batting like I was like, oh, man, maybe because you know, we just traded for him. So I was like, is he just now getting hot after we acquire him? Is it one of those things? But over the last four weeks, he's batting 218. And over the last seven days, he's batting 182. So it might literally be just what I'm watching, but his hits seem to be extremely timely lately. Uh, so, yeah, he could be one of those guys that... Now, you're always going to compare trade deadline acquisitions to what happened last year, which is really unfair because last year was such an anomaly, so much so that it's it, it made headlines across the nation because of how unusual our 2021 run was. You know, I mean, people don't really do that. People don't go, I mean, think about it like this. The Cubs and the Braves had the same record at the All-Star break last year. The Cubs decided to unload and the Braves decided to load up. And you saw how <laughs> different that ended up being for each team. But it was so unusual what we did last year. I'm trying not to compare every year to that, although it's going to be hard not to. But, you know, 
with Grossman, I was like, oh man, is this going to be our this year's jock or Jorge Soler or Eddie Rosario? You know, so, you know, the stats say absolutely not. <laughs> it's a dad, definitely not what's happening. But he's he's very timely at the moment. I just, I really think he's been clutch for us. So anyways, um, last note that I have here. Oh, this was funny. My wife hates Brian Jordan. She hates him. She has had enough of this whole Slada thing. I mean, it's, it, and I've said this before, I think at this point, it's like a bit, like, you know, when like somebody like says something wrong and people are giving them a hard time for it. And they're like, no, 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 no. That's just how I say it. That's how some people say it. It really is. That's fine. I mean, that's just, that seems like what Brian Jordan is doing at this point. He seems like he's doing a bit, this slada. It's like, dude, you got to stop. Just stop talking like that. It's okay. You can even admit like, oh man, I've had it wrong all these years. Like there was a guy that I worked with one time. He would say Auburn, like Arburn. He'd, he'd say Arburn. And we would always give him a hard time. We're like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, that's how you say it, man. And we're like, no, it's not. Like ask, I don't know, the entire world how you pronounce Auburn. And it's Auburn. And he's like, no, 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 Auburn. I was like, what are you? And then, but he just stuck to it. He dug his heels in. I think he was embarrassed because like a bunch of us were just calling him out and making fun of him. And then he just like, he pronounced it that much more ridiculously each time after that, just to kind of prove that, no, 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 it's not weird, you guys. I always do this just to really like prove a point. I think at that point, at this point, that's what Brian Jordan's doing. Brian Jordan, you got to stop. You got to start pronouncing slider right. Slada is incorrect, and we all know it. You know it. It's an embarrassment. My wife hates you. My wife can't even watch baseball whenever you're commentating right now because of how horrible you pronounce just that one word. Everything else is fine. I mean, you're not the most electric person ever to pick up the microphone, but like, I'm a big fan of you. You were a childhood hero of mine. My grandfather loved you. That means a lot to me, Brian. My grandpa was a big fan of you, but if he saw you today, he would be disappointed. He would say, you got to let it go. You got to just say it right. It's fine. We'll all forgive you. It's no big deal. Just just, just, just say it different. It's, it's totally fine. Okay, I'm done. I do love you, Brian Jordan. I was a big fan. I mean, really, when he, in the 90s, him playing for the Falcons and him playing for the Braves, it was just awesome. He was a great, he's a great person. He's a great guy. There's no, what's not to love about him? But... This whole slot of things just it's done. It's done. It's ru it's ruining you for me. Okay. Oh, I do have one more thing about the Braves, and that was just um just had this thought. Uh Guillermo Heredia just needs to stay forever. There's all of this talk about extending people. There's all this talk about like, you know, Michael Harris getting his contract, Austin Riley getting his contract, which is great, great, great news. Guillermo Heredia needs to be added to that list, not for his performance, because this year he's actually batting 136 with nine hits in total and three home runs. Um, so three of those nine hits are homers. You know, great, that's fine. Uh, but he's his, his stats are absolutely trash. But whenever I see him on screen, I just want to be around him. I want to be like in the dugout just to experience Guillermo Heredia. He's electric. He was our heartbeat last year in the playoffs. He is, he, without him, we wouldn't have the sword slash. You know, we wouldn't have a lot of energy that the Braves carry with them out on the field. You know when they all get a double, they look back to the dugout, you know who they're looking for? They're looking for Guillermo Heredia to give him the sword slash. It's great. And if they do it wrong, guess who's going to correct him when they come back in? Guillermo Heredia. He's the ultimate locker room guy. I, I just love seeing, I get almost as excited when someone hits a home, I, I get almost as excited to watch Guillermo Heredia react to a home run than the home run itself. You know, someone hits a home run, they watch it, they stop and stare, the crowd goes wild, it's great. The, the, the second home run, second breakfast, is them getting back into the dugout and Heredia just hyping them up. It's the best thing of all time. He just needs to be with this organization forever. So Anthopolis, sign him. I don't even know what his contract is. His playing is god-awful. He's terrible. Put him out in the field when you need him because he's a good fielder. But, you know, keep him around for that energy. He needs to be here for the rest of time. And then when he's done playing, he just needs to be around. He, he, he can, you know what? You know what? He can replace Washington. I'm not saying like now, I love Ron Washington, but you know, whenever that time comes, you know, hopefully in another like 50 years, he can then replace Ron Washington because who, I mean, who could wave someone home like Ron Washington other than Guillermo Heredia? Could you imagine seeing him? It's not even going to be a wave. He's going to be slashing guys to the home plate, you know, for years. It's it, That would be great. Just picture it. Picture it now. Heredia, think about it. 
trip on that. Hopefully this plants a seed that grows and blossoms into a wonderful life of us experiencing you on the third base uh, sideline. So anyways, that's just, I had some thoughts about Heredia. He's awesome. Um, Hashtag extend Heredia into eternity. Okay, going to move on to some Falcons. Falcons preseason game took place and we lost. 16-24, Sixteen to twenty-four, but there's plenty to talk about. <clears throat> Excuse me, with that loss because you know it's the preseason. Second half, guys are fighting for their jobs. You got to think, you know, we had eighty-five people on the roster, and today actually, well, I'm recording this on Tuesday, but yesterday, for when you guys are listening, on Tuesday the Falcons cut from eighty-five down to eighty, so, and we have to get to fifty-three in like three weeks, so. There's a lot of guys on this team right now that aren't going to be there by the time the season starts. So the second half is guys fighting for their jobs. It's not quite as clean. Maybe guys are being more selfish. I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't say. But um, the first and second team looked fantastic for the Falcons. Now we were playing the Jets. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe the Jets are great, and we don't realize it yet. But um, Mariota looked good. He went 6 for 10 with 132 yards and a touchdown. And Desmond Ritter, he looks awesome. He went 10 for 13 with 143 yards, no touchdowns, but his balls were on a dime. I mean, he is so accurate. His balls come out with force. He's got zip. He's got touch. He's got legs. He's got it all. That dude was just carving up the Jets on Monday night. Yep, it was Monday night, and it was awesome. I didn't even watch the Braves game because I was just, you know, mesmerized by Desmond Ritter. I just couldn't. I had to tune in. I'm okay, He's going to be a Hall of Famer. He's great. I mean, that's ridiculous. It's a, it's a stupid thing to say, but that's how I feel, okay? That's how I feel at this very moment that I think Des, Desmond Ritter is legit. You know, Arthur Smith said he had some operational errors. He did kind of screw up in the red zone, but you don't know who it was necessarily. Like, you know, but you kind of think that the quarterback – is running everything from an operational standpoint. There's so many things going on in his head, and so when you have these pre-snap penalties, it's kind of weird. You go, okay, is that on the line or is that on the quarterback? Was that on his cadence? Was that on his snap count? Was he managing the game properly? I have no idea. Arthur Smith seemed to get really pissed off. Arthur Smith got heated on Monday night. He was getting really, really pissed. But Desmond Ritter, the dude's the truth. Just go back and look at his highlights. Look at what he did on Monday night against the Jets. His balls were just boom, just coming out of there with such force and so accurate. There was a couple of balls that were just squeezed into such a tight window that I was like, okay, start him. Week one. He's good. It's fine. How do you make those throws and not start in that league? You know, shows what I know because obviously – you know, that it's not much when it comes to stuff like that. But Desmond Ritter looks legit. Cannot wait to see this guy. I really think he's going to be the starter by like week six. You know, a buddy of mine thinks it's going to be week three. You know, and not to take anything away from Mariota because I'm a big Mariota fan just in general. Even before he came to the Falcons, I liked him at Tennessee. I understand kind of what happened. You had Tannehill come in who kind of took over. But from everything that you hear, just, I don't know, if you just... Google NFL stuff enough like I do. Everyone loves the guy. Everyone loves Mariota. He's a great locker room guy, and he's a great player. He's fast. I mean, he was a Heisman Trophy winner. That's not nothing. So I'm a Mariota fan. I think he's legit. I wish him well. I want him to do good things. And maybe I'm just a sucker for, like, new, you know? I mean, I'm a victim to that plenty, where something new and shiny comes along and I just lose sight of everything else. And right now, Desmond Ritter is that new and shiny thing that I just want to see out there just tearing it up for the Falcons. So um, either way, you know, rough loss. Some people were saying that, like, um, due to all the fights at the joint practices that the Falcons really wanted to win that preseason game. I don't know. I mean, maybe. I mean... I'm sure they want to win every game. They they actually interviewed Kyle Pitts on the sideline and said, do you, how badly do you guys want to win this game? And he was like, well, really badly. We want to win every game. You know, they're professional athletes. They're professional. They get paid to compete. So, yeah, they're going to be really competitive all the time. But, um, you know, I don't know how bad those fights were. And there was three, quote, unquote, skirmishes that happened when we were up in New York. Were they that big of a deal, or was there just not anything else to report on throughout the last week? I mean, we are in August, by the way, so, you know, headlines come at a premium. So, yeah. 
whatever. Anyways, last note from the Falcons is Felipe Franks looks terrible. His Madden rating would be like 50. I mean, he like, he didn't, he was throwing to no one. He just threw like, even like when he threw, so he threw a couple like into the end zone that no one was there. It was like wrong route entirely. Felipe didn't know what was going on. The receiver didn't know what was going on. But even if the receiver ran the route that should have gone to where the ball was, it looked like it was still going to be 10 feet over the guy's head. I mean, it was just horrible. He went two for six with eight yards and just did not seem on the same page with anyone. And Arthur Smith got really heated when they were down in the red zone and couldn't score. He looked so pissed off. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so and that's it. Nothing else to report for the Falcons. Oh, that's not true. We made some cuts. Yeah, I said I was going to say this from AtlantaFalcons.com. So here are the five cuts that we have made. So as of Wednesday, August 24th, uh, receivers Auden Tate, Geronimo Allison, defensive back Lafayette Pitts, outside linebacker Kwani Deng were all cut. And the team announced that defensive lineman Jalen Dalton was waived with an injury. So I think he could still technically come back. But with those four cuts and with that wave, they are now at 80. So it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller. So it's crunch time. They've got, uh, they're at 80 and they've got, what would that be? 27 more to go to get the 53. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, moving on, uh, the World Baseball Classic is in March of 2023. Are you guys excited for that? I really, that, that, that's a genuine question. I don't know. Do people care about the World Baseball Classic? I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't really paid that much of attention to the last couple. The first few that happened, I was pretty, you know, hyped about because I was like, this is cool. Um, but I'm getting like re-excited. I'm getting reintroduced to the World Baseball Classic. I saw something where they just announced that Ken Griffey Jr. was going to be the hitting coach. So that's pretty sick. So I took a look at just kind of what we're looking at coaching staff wise and roster wise. So I have some notable commits and uh, a list of coaches here for you. So for Team USA in the World Baseball Classic of 2023, the manager is going to be Mark DeRosa, the bench coach, coach Jerry Manuel, the pitching coach is going to be Andy Pettit. That's sick. The hitting coach is Ken Griffey Jr. Really sick. The first base coach is Lou Collier. Third base coach, Dino Ebel. Ebel. And the bullpen coach is Dave Rigetti. So, okay, that's our coaching staff. The notable USA commits for the World Baseball Classic of 2023 is Mike Trout, Trevor Story, Nolan Arenado, Paul Goldschmidt, JT Real Muto, Bryce Harper, Pete Alonzo, and Cedric Mullins. That is awesome. I am really excited to watch that. Just from seeing that, I'm like, okay, I'm in now. You know, seeing all those guys on the same team playing against, you know, the Dominican Republic, you know, some Japanese in Japan, you know, you're going to see some MLB guys, mainly Shohei Otani, I would think, playing for Japan. But yeah, seeing these guys go up against some other stars that are playing for their country, it's going to be a different kind of energy. The finals are going to be in Miami this year. And yeah, it's um it's gonna be sick because the first leg of the tournament, some games are gonna be played in Phoenix, some games are gonna be played in Japan, and then the finals and the semifinals, I believe, are coming into Miami. So gonna be really exciting. So that's gonna be next year, and it happens once every god, what is that, three years, I think, but they haven't had one for six years. I guess they would have, oh, wow, they would have had it in 2020. There you go, COVID, thanks. Um, we're going to go back through some of the winners. So in 06, in the inception of the World Baseball Classic was Japan. They were the winners that year. In 09 was also Japan. In 2013 was the Dominican Republic. In 2017, the USA got their first ever victory and first and only victory. And fun fact, Puerto Rico has been the runner-up in the last two uh, tournaments. So in 2013 and 2017, the Puerto Rican team came in second. You know, bummer. You know, if you ain't first, you're last. Come on, Puerto Rico, step it up. But yeah, the USA are going to be coming back as defending champs. And it's pretty cool because with baseball, it's not like the USA is going to run away with this. <clears throat> I mean, they haven't. You know, when you think about basketball or football, I mean, soccer, we suck. 
you know, I mean, obviously it's just such a global sport, but you know, with baseball, you, you know, they, they, the, the main, the professionals come here to play, but the USA does not dominate in baseball. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, think of all the stars that we have around the league. You think of Juan Soto, you think of Ronald Acuna, you think of Fernando Tatis, you know what I mean? You think of all these guys and yeah, a lot of big name guys for a long time have been playing for other, have been, have come here from other countries. So excited to see what that looks like. I'm going to commit to you now that I'm going to be paying attention to that when it happens next March. And I hope you guys will too. It'll be fun. So going to wrap this show up with a few different things here for you. A shorter show today, so I hope you've enjoyed it. But uh, first thing here is Albert Pujols is on a race to 700 home runs. He is currently at 693. He hit home run number 693 on August 22nd, I believe that was a grand slam, which is just awesome. But um, I'm pulling for pa- Albert Pujols to hit that number. I mean, you know, he's a lot older. I think he's got like 14 on the year, but he's got some time. He's got like, you know, a month and a half to come up with seven more. I'm not sure what the odds are on that. They're leaning toward no last time I saw them. it was, But it was like 40-60, something like that. So... Yeah, let's get be pretty cool. It'd be very poetic if Pujols can hit 700. Not many people have done it. Only three players have ever done it. Um, A Rod got close, like 696. Ooh, sorry, buddy. Um, so yeah, if Pujols can come in and get the 700, that'd be good. I, I I would root for that more than I think I would have Alex Rodriguez back in the day, which I think a lot of people would agree with me in saying that. Um, Kevin Durant is staying in Brooklyn. So if anyone's been following some NBA news. Uh, Kevin Durant is staying in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, according to a statement from Nets general manager Sean Marks. This is from ESPN.com. And Durant initially asked for a trade on June 30th and reiterated that desire in a meeting with Joe Tsai in London earlier this month. Sources confirmed to ESPN. During that meeting, Durant wanted Tsai to choose between him and the brain trust of Nash and Marks. Ooh. Yeah, some... That's just, that sucks. That's not cool. There's a tension in Brooklyn. But instead, Nash and Marks will retain their jobs while Durant will remain in Brooklyn. His four-year, $198 million extension he signed last offseason kicks in this season. So I guess they kissed and made up. Um, It's uh, Durant and Irving are both still on the team. And let's see, this paragraph says... Irving and Durant are still with the team. The Nets will look to improve upon last year's first-round playoff exit and hope Ben Simmons will be a part of that. Huh. You might want to look somewhere else. Ben Simmons, you know, I don't think a lot of people have a whole lot of faith in that guy. Um, Simmons would trade to Brooklyn in a deal that sent James Harden to Philly, but he has not yet made his Nets debut. Simmons underwent a microdiscectomy procedure in May to address his pain located in a herniated disc in his lower back, but he's expected to be healthy for training camp. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So anyways, Kevin Durant thought he was going to be moving. He is not. He is staying put. Nick Saban is in the news. He made headlines because he is now the highest paid college football coach. Kirby Smart had a brief Run at the top. So Alabama approved, this is also from ESPN.com, Alabama approves a raise and an extension for football coach Nick Saban through 2030. So he was already signed through like 2029, but they extended him one more year and they gave him a raise and they're going to pay him an average of $11.7 million a year. And that raise, raise edges Saban's annual compensation over that of Georgia coach Kirby Smart, who signed a new deal early in the offseason that pays him an average of an $11.2 million over 10 years. So Kirby Smart's getting 11.2 a year on average, while Saban is now going to be making 11.7. Damn. Yeah, he's getting paid. And they did you know that Nick Saban was 70 years old? 70 years old. I did not think he looks good. I mean, I'll give it to him. He doesn't, you know, I don't know if he's dying his hair or what, but he does not look <clears throat> 70. I mean, he looks, um, I, I would have guessed, I guess probably mid sixties. I, I would have guessed mid sixties, but when I, you know, seeing the seven officially, I was like, Oh damn. So that's, he's going to be coaching at least, you know, I mean, if all goes well, until he's 77. This contract puts him through age 77. How crazy is that? He's going to be, his tenure at Alabama is going to end up having run 
what would that be, about 25 years, maybe just slightly less than that, but how incredible is that? Um, so yeah, I mean, congrats, I guess, Nick Saban. I mean, I uh, I do feel a, um, a rivalry with Alabama. I don't particularly like them, but I don't feel as much hatred toward them as I do like the Florida Gators or you know, the Mets or the Saints. I don't know if you guys agree with me on that. Um, because Alabama, at least histor- over the last decade, you would say that Alabama is our biggest rival based on the games that we've played and the meaning behind those games and how good those games have been consistently. You know, the in the edge absolutely goes to Alabama in those games, which I think that's starting to turn. It's You know, the times are changing, but um, that's how it's been. And so you'd think that we would have this big-time rivalry, but it doesn't feel like that, does it? It feels more like a a mutual respect. I think I hated Alabama more before Georgia got good. I mean, we've been good for a while, but before we got on their level in terms of respect and kind of like how I feel about the team and what their expectations are, um, yeah, I think I hated Alabama more. I hated them a lot when they beat us in the national championship, and I hated them you know, a lot when they won the next year in the SEC championship, but it still didn't feel... <laughs> Honestly, I hated Alabama the most when we lost to them in 2012 in that SEC championship. I think it's because in my heart I felt like Georgia had a team that they were meant to win that year, but I felt like they're, they had these waves of great teams. You know, That year they had a great roster and they had a really good run toward the end. And then it was like in the 2000s when we had uh, no Sean Marino, Matt Stafford, A.J. Green, there was a year there where I was like, we could beat anybody in the country, hands down. But it was they were spaced out. And so it felt like they just stole our dreams from us. I was like, you guys win all the time. This is our year, and you're taking it from us. But even since the national championship and whatever that was, 2017, I feel like we've just belonged. And like whenever we lose, I don't feel like we're never going to get back there again. I'm like, oh, okay, well, we'll get them next year. And so... I'm sort of just thinking out loud right now, but I don't know if that makes sense to you guys too. I Alabama, um, I respect them. You know, I'm like, yeah, you guys are good, and so are we. We play great, great games against one another. It's just kind of cool at this point. So maybe I should feel differently about that, but I just don't. So, you know, for whatever that's worth. Congrats to Nick Saban for getting your extension, I guess. Um, maybe they just did it just to edge him over Kirby Smart. I don't know. He lost a natty, so they're like, you know what? We're going to give you this win, buddy. Um, okay, this is going to pretty much wrap up the show. Um, our softball season starts on Monday. Excited for that. A bunch of grown men playing softball. For any of you guys playing softball out there, my hat's off to you. You know, it's um, it's a wonderful thing when we get to go out there and feel like we're, you know, I mean, it's just, I get really competitive. You know, I love it. It's fantastic. I feel as if I'm playing in the World Series every time I step out on the softball field. I really do. And it's all that matters. My focus hones in. I get very narrow-minded, and it's a great thing. It's a good feeling. Men need that feeling. We need that hyper-focus and drive. And softball absolutely gives that to me 100%. Um, So excited to start on Monday, fellas. Uh, Trivia answer. Here you go. So the trivia question was, if you don't remember was who has the record for the best batting average in a season? Post-1900, who has the record for the best batting average in a single season? And the answer to that question is Nap LaJori. Yes, Nap LaJori. N-A-P, Nap, last name L-A-J-O-R-I-E. I I might have pronounced LaJori wrong, but Nap LaJori in 1901 batted 426. I mean, that's kind of crazy. And here's, you know what, here's a fun fact about this trivia question. I would have been so shocked if anybody had gotten that. I think a lot of people probably would have thought Ted Williams would have been a great guess. He's on, I think, the top 10 or 20. But um, everybody on the top 20 played in 1941 or sooner. So Ted Williams did it in 1941. He had a really high batting average. He was over 400, I believe. And... Everyone in the top 20 of batting average was prior to 1941, except for one person. So bonus trivia question here. Do you know who the one person post-1941 to be on the top 20 single-season batting average record list is? That person was Tony Gwynn. 
Tony Gwynn in 1994 batted 394, and he is the only person post-1941 to be on the top 20 single-season batting average record list. Everyone else, it was like 1925, 1931, 1909, 1901, and they were just all just batting like crazy, hitting over 400. It was nuts. Tony Gwynn hit for three. His batting average was 394 and 94. Unreal. I mean, Greg Maddox talks openly about how he was his toughest out. Um, Man, RIP Tony Gwynn. That dude was so good. And you think about these great hitters. You don't really think about Tony Gwynn, at least... You know, it's batting average just isn't as sexy as home runs. I mean, the home runs are always going to be the ultimate statistic in in baseball because it's like that is just what when you see these guys who are just big and strong and powerful and their hand eye coordination is great and everything, all the stars have aligned for them physically and mentally. And when you can actually do the hardest thing in all of sports, which is hit a baseball and not only do that, but hit it that far and over the fence, that is just such a monumental feat of just physicality and sportsmanship that when you see that it's just you know you just it's like that is the pinnacle is hitting a home run in a major league baseball game so we think about players like Barry Bonds and Hank Aaron and Babe Ruth and Alex Rodriguez and Albert Pujols and all these guys but batting average I mean if hitting the ball is in itself the hardest thing to do because there's a lot of guys who can hit for power but their average sucked. I think Jason Giambi, he's the first person to come to my mind for that for some reason because he would have these like monster home run seasons but be hitting in like the 240s. A lot of guys are like that. Honestly, Matt Olson's like that this year. He's hit a lot of RBIs, but he's batting sub 250. And so, you know, you go, man, who's the better hitter? Who actually is the better hitter? I mean, these home runs are really cool. But to be that successful with getting a base hit that often, that's why Barry Bonds was so good. Is because he was hitting bombs like nobody's business. And yeah, steroids or not, I don't know, whatever. But steroids or not, the dude would hit like 330 in a year. 350, I think he did in one year, with like 60-plus home runs. Barry Bonds was outstanding. So when you can hit that consistently, I mean, that's why Freddie Freeman is so good. It's not because of his power, although he has some. It's because even this year, I think he's batting over 320. And so Tony Gwynn, 394 in 1994. Good Lord, man. That is, I don't know if anyone else is going to do that. You know, not with the way that it's played now. I mean, a lot of guys, these guys are getting these monster extensions are hitting like 250. You know, it's just the game's different. And um, to be that successful at the hardest thing in all of sports, Tony Gwynn, you are the man, and so are you, Nap Lajori, back in 1901, batted 426. That's insane. Although I kind of in my head just figured, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, everyone sucked back then. It's honestly not the case. I mean, they were still really good, but, you know, it is what it is. So anyways, thank you, as always, for listening, you guys. Really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate all the support that we're getting on TikTok. Check us out. It's at All Georgia Sports, at All GA Sports. On Twitter, it's at all GA Sports Guy. All Georgia Sports Guy on Twitter, all Georgia Sports on TikTok. You can also just type in all gas in either one of those. You'll probably find us. We're also on YouTube and do the same thing there. So please go support us. You can find some clips. You can find some, you know, some visuals to what I'm saying. And Robbie, you've done a fantastic job with those videos. Some of them are really funny. So uh, yeah, go check them out. It's fun stuff. I love being here with you guys. And you know what? It's the middle of the week. I know you're right in the middle of the grind. It's hump day, you know, but after today, you know, when you're getting to the halfway point, you're counting up. After that, you're counting down and it's a lot easier to count down. You're counting down to the weekend. We're counting down to the Falcons preseason finale on Saturday. We're counting down to the Braves swallowing the Mets and then pooping them out into next season. We are counting down to some wonderful, wonderful things. So you know what? Have that perspective and go make someone's day today. Go be a wonderful person. Be of service. Be selfless. Be a good teammate. Give someone a compliment. See to it. If you can celebrate someone's accomplishments publicly to where someone else can notice that, if you can help someone else get noticed in a positive way, do it. That's how you can make someone's day today. Or be creative. Do something else. I'm just spitballing here. But you know what? Go just go give more than you take. And with that, I love you. And I will see you guys on Friday. See ya.